The body without organs is like the cosmic egg, the giant molecule swarming with worms, bacilli, Lilliputian figures, animalcules, and homunculi, with their organization and their machines, minute strings, ropes, teeth, and fingernails, levers and pulleys, catapults. Thus, in Schraber, the millions of spermatozoids in the sunbeams are the souls that lead with a brief existence as little men on his body. Arto says, This world of microbes, which is nothing more than coagulated nothingness, the two sides of the body without organs are, therefore, the side on which the mass phenomenon and the paranoiac investment corresponding to it and the other side on which a submicroscopic scale, the molecular phenomenon, and their schizophrenic investments are arranged. It is on the body without organs as a pivot, as a frontier between the molar and the molecular, that the paranoia-schizophrenia division is made. Are we to believe, then, that social investments are secondary productions, as if a large two-headed schizonoiac father of the primitive horde were at the base of the socius in general? We have seen that this is not at all the case. The socia is not a projection of the body without organs. Rather, the body without organs is the limit of the socius, its tangent of deterritorialization. The ultimate residue of a deterritorialized socius, the socius, the earth, the body of the despot, capital money, are all full-clothed bodies, just as the body without organs is a naked full body. But the latter exists at the limit, at the end, not at the origin. And doubtless, the body without organs haunts all forms of socius. But in this very sense, if social investments can be said to be paranoiac or schizophrenic, it is to the extent that they have paranoia and schizophrenia as ultimate products under the determinate conditions of capitalism. The very roots of evil, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is how can state of things, pure violence. This is the typical violence of information. It's violent because what happens there is the murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. Welcome to Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins, as always, sponsored by the People's Institute for Revolutionary Semiotics. Before we begin our discussion today, we just want to mention we've got a Patreon account, patreon.com forward slash M-U-H-H. Consider dropping us a buck a month there, and if not, perhaps consider leaving a nice review for us on iTunes. But today, Taylor and I are very happy to be diving back into Antiedipus, the ninth in our seminar series, looking at the work. And today's focus is going to be the first three sections of chapter four, introduction to schizoanalysis, the social field, the molecular, unconscious, and psychoanalysis, and capitalism. We're working through it. It looks like we could wrap up with one final episode because the last two sections, which are on the the two positive tasks of schizoanalysis are about 60 pages for today we read about 50 pages so i think that yeah. kind of fits within even though it's a lot of ground to, to cover yeah exactly and we won't be able to get everything yeah exactly i didn't even know if we would be able to get everything in these three sections beyond. oh it's, it's not gonna happen but we're gonna let the partial objects guide us you know as we see them and the translators redefine partial objects in the sections that we read. It's not Melanie Klein's part objects, which would be extended parts based on like a lost unity or totality, which is something that they've in their materialist metaphysics or whatever you want to call it, since sort of the opening chapters have constantly warned us about, right? right which is yeah. warning us about unities that are either at the beginning and have to be rediscovered or that totalize a whole. This is particularly their understanding of not only desiring machines, but body without organs, also just their category of multiplicity. It's multiplicity that for them cannot be totalized, or if there is, if you will, a whole, it's a part alongside the other parts. And this almost like, it's a counterintuitive, it's contradictory in a set theoretical sense, but I think for them, they take it very seriously. If I had to represent this, I would say it's like a mummy and then it's organs in the canopic jars there that's that's funny <laughs> they're still part of one the mummy of... is is an empty part alongside the yeah so instead of the part objects 
the partial objects that are guiding us today, as we see the French term that is used to describe, it's a different word than, they have two words in French that we only have one word. We have the one word partial, which can mean of or relating to parts, but we also have the sense of a partial judge, right? A partial, a biased witness. And so this is how they use it in the, um, in the French. The translators have a nice little note saying like, We've been continually calling it partial objects leading up to this point where they specifically say in the French, no, no, it's not partial objects as in part whole, it's partial objects as in as in bias, as in making selections. And they, they have this whole monstrous sentence where they describe it, which I won't read, but they say um, they are not partial in the sense of extensive parts, but rather partial biased like the intensities under which a unit of matter always fills space in varying degrees. Pure positive multiplicity where everything is possible without exclusion of irrigation, yada, yada, yada. Like it goes on for yeah. 12 more lines. It's, it's, a, it's a bunch. Uh, but, you know, what's interesting is that like when they, when they bring up in, I think, chapter one, that Kant's theory of matter is, is highly schizophrenic. They're coming back to this notion because it's schizophrenic for them because in in the sense in which Kant talks about intensive matter, at least if I remember correctly, they say that it fills up space. It's this filling up of space intensively rather than occupying space out there extensively. It's these like degrees of intensity that fill matter or that kind of fill it out and fill up space. I think for them is what they're kind of hearkening back to. Anyway, I think I was making just a, a bad pun to say, like, you know, <laughs> we're going to focus on the shit that comes out in our little, our shit flows of desire as we speak about this stuff, right? Because, you know, there's no way to exhaust all of this. I do have a couple of things that I want to say about the partial objects, but I'll let you wrap up if you were going to go a different direction. What struck you? I think I brought this up previously in the anti Oedipus seminars about, we've discussed this bit about partial objects before. Yeah, we anticipated a little bit. Yeah. My question then that I'll recapitulate here is, is the partiality, is the bias towards a function? I had characterized it as, let's say, like your mouth is partial to eating, but it's not determined. It's not overdetermined as far as like your mouth could do a number. It could have any kind of function, but there are certain functions that are, it's more partial to, I suppose if that makes sense. Same with like any, an ass, right? An ass can fart, it can shit. It's partial to those functions, but it can also obviously lead to a sort of erotic pleasure as well. Mm -hmm. They are, these partial objects that they list, what the mouth, the anus, the eye as degrees of matter, all three of those can obviously are already kind of supercharged with, um, with sexuality, even if the eye can't be an orifice like the mouth and the anus for penetration, there's still a sense in which the eye is constantly penetrated by all sort of optical stimuli, right? Yeah. And, and it can and, be, yeah, it can receive pleasure through the whatever visual or the ocular through, drive or whatever. Through the like, visual, yeah. Not just in voyeurism. Reading, right? I mean, reading is not reading, yeah. reading is not a given, you know, that's a, and you can derive enjoyment. From reading so that's an example of how eyes would be partial to seeing which is a function but that function is sort of not infinite but has a lot of potentiality there's a multiplicity of potential functions i suppose would be maybe the way to articulate that we were talking about lacan before we started and how they actually say some nice things about lacan even while critiquing some of the lacanian assemblages right yeah. of real symbolic imaginary or the phallus there's somewhere in Lacan, I think it's in the Acree, but I, I could be totally misremembering and I probably am botching this, but Lacan says something counterintuitive about how the function precedes the organ. So like sight precedes the eye in a certain way and stimulates the evolution of the eye. So it's not that we, we have eyes and then sort of develop, it's not sort of like life or matter eyes develop and then the possibility of seeing comes on the scene and therefore the eye kind of yeah so the function exists yeah okay so so the, the function function, function the is function, primary yeah kind of like the function precedes the organ which seems very counterintuitive well if you're thinking to, about to, this to in an terms everyday of, if yeah. you're thinking about this you know in terms of a problematic right like what's the problem is that's a good point you sort of need to the organism needs to i don't know have some type of perception right like that's the issue the sort of function is 
being bombarded by a different stimuli and adapting to that to that milieu of whether where we think about it in terms of information. I guess you could say it in Simon Dunn's term, right? That the stream of different information channels precedes the individuation by which right, those yeah, information yeah. channels can be navigated and can be used to benefit, et cetera. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, once you like work through it, but Lacan, as always, is <laughs> going to say something explosive like this yeah. and not necessarily <laughs> unpack it for us and sort of use it to then talk about some related issue that, but you're still kind of stuck on this. this yeah, this. I like the way that you mobilize Simon Doan there that I think that was a great articulate way to kind of get it. I was going to say too, like, it's almost like the thing where Deleuze is saying, you know, the problems and the, or the, what is it? The, the solution and the problem or yeah, sort of a problems determinations, you know, it, it gets the solutions it deserves by how well determined the, the problem is. Yeah. I like the kind of way you posed it that, you know, you can imagine different problems to be solved would yeah would that would drive morphology and evolution right. right so morphology and this continuous or what they'll call in a thousand plateaus infinite variation that you know we can think and this is something well, that, i mean we can look at nature and see this problem as being solved in a num in a multiplicity of ways right oh like yeah bats you know i'm thinking about Ecolocation, yeah. That, uh, you know, creatures that live on like the thermal vents at the bottom of the ocean, etc. Right. Like there's there's less it's so dark down there, right? There's no light per se, right? So how do they deal with sensory, you know? Or under the ocean with another type of sonar used by whales, dolphins, you have yeah. in the very bottoms of the ocean various forms of bioluminescence that are not just for they're not just for feeding purposes, but for mating purposes. Right there's all, there's all kinds of bioluminescent entities in the yeah. of the ocean, that, like the anglerfish. I'm thinking in particular is one. Yeah, but even smaller, like there are different plankton and and such that reproduce by mimicking their mates' bioluminescent patterns. That's a whole ethological thing that's beyond my purview. But it's just <laughs> a little, it's just a little bit of stuff that we can kind of relate to how. These different media in which our senses are involved, whether it be, you know, olfactory sort of gaseous molecules, the differentiation of taste and the way our tongues are, are sort of uh, primed, they evolve to distinguish salty from bitter, from sweet, etc. You know, to our eyes that we were just talking about, to hearing these different media of these channels of information, as I was kind of saying, you right. know, they, information they sort of processing. Uh, they sort of interfaces. Yeah. It's like the interface yeah. reality. Yeah. Yeah. User yeah. So, interface kind of in a way. So, so the channels, the reason why I think in this way is because Simon Don himself will define individuation and individuals by systems of information. So this is kind of how he tries to solve this chicken egg problem, which we'll get to in a second about the chicken and the egg. It's kind of setting up to it, but I'll leave off here with when he looks at, like, for example, sponge colonies, different colonies where it's hard to distinguish where one individual begins and another ends in the colony. The colony is almost this, this interesting sort of mixing, if you will, or this, it makes it hard to differentiate where an individual and a collective begin. And so he turns mm. to, he turns to how different systems of information can help to provide a criterion by which we can sort of look at an individual. But it's very precarious because, you know, in the sponge collective, the sprouts that form, I can't remember the word, the stumps that form. Polyps. I'm think, well, polyps, I think, are more, I was thinking like, uh, what do you call it? Coral, which I think is similar, right? I think they're really Yeah. So, you know, these, these little polyps form, these stumps form, they both extend the colony, but they can also break away and start a new colony. So, like, there is this continuity that's very interesting for that animal life form. But in any case, we were... Uh, I like how your example problematizes the uh, analogous to, like, the way that the family, like Oedipus, sort mm -hmm. of, like, it highlights how the problematics of Oedipus as this closing off of the flows, whereas something like the coral are a more deterritorialized social animal that doesn't trap itself in these representational forms. But let me go back real quick to the uh, partial objects because I did have one other thing that I just wanted to mention. And this goes back to Leibniz a bit too on the body without organs is like these little, the um, 
the singularities are biased in the sense that they they only see their perspective, right? So they have a bias because they don't see the they can only see sort of within their purview, right? They don't have a totalizing vision. I mean, in a certain sense, they mirror the cosmos or the universe, but only from their limited perspective. And so what's local is privileged versus right. what is further and, and, and less distinct. So in that sense, yeah, I mean, you, you could talk about something similar with... Uh, I mean, that's even interesting to think about, like this movement back and forth between... There's not a hard limit, but it's like a... It's this um, sort of relative limit. The edge of that doesn't... There's not a hard line, like an essential point where that stops, but there's a... That, like that bubble or sort of thing can expand, it can contract, etc. It's not overdetermined. I think that that's part of what they're trying to articulate with with partial objects, because for them, as I kind of said quickly earlier, you know, the notion of what's usually translated or what's what in English, what Melanie Klein puts forward as part objects would sort of privilege this. Uh, it would kind of privilege a, a pre-established unity, if you will. Right. right. Yeah. And whether it be the unity of the body or the unity of the machine, right? Because we we can talk about this soon about their playing off mechanism and vitalism against each other, which they find right. in Samuel Butler. But you can kind of see those two unities, whether it be a structural unity of the machine or a, a personal unity of the organism. For them, both of those are are sort of wrong ways to think about part objects or partial objects. <laughs> because Partial objects, part objects in Melanie Klein's sense would be extensive, would be parts and whole in a kind of classical way of thinking about that relationship. And I think for them, partial in the sense of intensities as an intensive question of filling out space insofar as it's intensive. This is why they, they're they always talking about intensity on the body without organs and not sort of the body without organs out there somewhere or having a unity that is presupposed or ideal, that is kind of constantly being reconfigured, being traversed by intensities, and these intensities never cancel out. You know, one can imagine ways in which parts in a whole would combine in a classical sense in a way that is still too on a molar statistical aggregate level. This is part of what they're trying to do in the molecular unconscious section is keep trying to sort of juxtapose this this molar, this big view where it seems logical to look at the machine as sort of mirroring an organism in its unity of parts or look at the organism as having a, a sort of mechanistic unity, right? With its limbs, with its with its eyes, with whatever, and they are all just parts that are working together as a whole. That's sort of ideally privileged by a kind of classical view at a static view, right? Yeah, at organisms. Yeah. I mean the way that they the way that they talk about the body without organs, I think really highlights this if it's the orchid and the wasp or the yeah, the spider and its web. Um, you know, I'm thinking a, a clownfish and anemone. There's so many different. Well, the, the the spider and its web is what they describe Proust's narrator as. But the the orchid and the wasp is first. It comes back up in a thousand plateaus in the rhizo rhizome introduction. But they do bring up the wasp and the orchid. They bring up what is it? The um, the bumblebee and some kind of flower. I mean, it's this really process based view of the carving up of reality into it's the red clover and the bumblebee so the red clover has no reproductive system okay so it says can we say that the red clover has no reproductive system because the bumblebee and only the bumblebee must help it reproduce and he's like no and that this is their example which they get from um chauvin this notion of a of the wasp and the orchid the orchid yeah. mirrors the sort of female the yeah. female wasp and entices the male wasp to help it reproduce and to kind of, they talk about this as a parallel evolution in, uh, in a thousand plateaus. But here we can see that what they're saying is when we stop taking our sort of anthropomorphic representation of sex as the standard and think outside of that way of 
reproducing, then we can see that uh, even if on the larger level, it seems that at the end of the line, man is responsible for making machines, we can easily imagine there are ways in which machines can make other machines. We can easily imagine that kind of autogenesis just as we can. I mean, it is the desiring machines that reproduce through humans, right? Well, uh, through the unconscious, I think. Just wanted to make that distinction, right? Because well, does them, the human does the unconscious not presume or presuppose a human? I don't think so. I think this is their non anthropomorphic vision of sex that they get from Marx and what they want to attribute to the desiring machines. That you know, we could say with the unconscious, it's almost like humans right now are the most viable form in which the the unconscious can reproduce itself. As far as we know, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's restricted. And, you know, there's a sense in which for them, the unconscious is not sort of individually located in, right. in a human child or father. And it's not necessarily even on the union side, this collective unconscious, right? They, they want to think of it sort of beyond this individual collective divide. Yeah. And Watcher, we would call it machinic. Here, they're calling it molecular. They turn to another analyst, which is about this genic unconscious. And they just want to, you know, they even say, like, what, at the beginning of the chapter that the unconscious is, <laughs> the domain of the unconscious is, is physics. All right. So, saying all this shit that seems very counterintuitive from the legacy we've inherited from Freudian psychoanalysis. And I think that they're not just trying to be controversial or polemic or not just for the shock value, but I do think that there is something, you know, where for them to restrict desire and the unconscious to the human, because that is the predominant type in which we can see unconscious phenomena more or less directly or indirectly would be a mistake in a certain yeah. sense. That's interesting because I've, I think I've been sort of, conceiving of the machinic unconscious as this quasi Jungian, what is it? The collective unconscious as he refers to it. They don't necessarily dislike this notion that the investment of desire is, is immediately social. Right. Yeah. They I guess don't... that's what's confusing about it. Like how do you distinguish between that's probably a question for another day. We could probably do a whole episode on that question. I would. Well, imagine. when they bring up Zondi, they say Zondi set out on this molecular path discovering a genic unconscious that he contrasted with the Freudian individual conscious, as well as with Jung's collective unconscious. And, you know, they go on through this question of the realm of functions, right? Because it's, it's where at the molecular level, you know, machines, how do they put it? Because this is also Rie that... What's his deal? <laughs> is he an analytic or is he... More of no, a, no, no. Oh, where for functioning and formation are are not distinguished. So on the molecular level, desiring machines, their formation and their function are the same. Production right. and product is the same. They're what they're. My point being that the collective unconscious, I think, and they don't go into detail here, but I think for them, the collective unconscious is a way of, in a certain sense, it's more interesting than Freud. But on the other sense, it seems to still, it relies on this ideal level of subjective representation just writ large. It would still take, in a certain sense, it would still, whether we consider the archetypes as these sort of symbolic coordinates for interpreting desire or whatever other union sort of archetype. I think one of the things, I think even more than that, though, what they, what they dislike in Jung it's partly what they dislike in certain phases of Freud, where sexuality gets subordinated, right? For them, they're at pains in this chapter to kind of point out how, you know, sexuality is, that desire is immediately sexual, and that the unconscious is the realm of delirium, is the realm of sexuality, right? Where they say they want to keep from this way in which libido is desexualized and sublimated in order to invest the social. And then if it's resexualized, that's where mental illness comes in. 
I think for them, that's this completely negative view of sexuality that Freud sometimes slips into, for example, in the Schraber case, which is why they say the truth is that sexuality is everywhere, the way a bureaucrat follows right, his records, yeah. a judge administers justice. Um, yeah, I was glad like, to see that. The libido for them doesn't have to sort of be asepticized and, and sublimated in order to invest the large aggregates. I think it just takes a different path to call it sublimation, to say it's desexualized somehow in order to invest the social. I think for them, that is that gets on tenuous ground that can't really, for them, be supported. And I think that Freud is the main purveyor of this. On the other side, Jung is thinking of libido as psychical energy in general that may or may not have sexual components at all. And I think that that too has its, for them, has its own pitfalls. So in any case, they don't really go too deep on that here with Jung, at least. They just kind of bring him in to to kind of say that, you know, these ways of thinking about sexuality and the desiring machines, it's not necessarily a tension between the individual and the collective because, you know, the when they say there's desire in the social and nothing else, right? There, there's social machines and desiring machines are the same, but they're different regimes, right? And the regimes, as we've seen, is this statistical aggregate, the large aggregates on the molar level, and then the molecular investments, right? So this is another way of kind of rethinking the paralogisms where when they talk about incest being impossible, you're either sort of on this sub-representative level where you don't have global persons of mommy, of sister, of daddy. And so incest is impossible on that one side, or you're on the large aggregate side where, you know, you may have the persons, but sort of the names don't stick, right? They say it's like a, a stamp that's too wet and it slides off. So you're, you're sort of constantly at this limit Incest is the limit. It's the for them, right? It's that limit between the sort of molecular and the molar, and it's and it's only by sort of doing a kind of mental gymnastics that it can be made into this theater of of Hamlet, of Oedipus, of whatever we want to call it. I might take a moment to back up and just ask an extremely basic question, and because they spend a lot of time in this, in these sections, at least at first. At the beginning, sort of talking about how, and really, I think the main takeaway is, and we've discussed this before, that social repression is primary to psychic repression and how that relates to the family and desire. And my question would be, is it as simple or I, maybe, yeah, obviously, I feel like this has got to be reductive. Is it that literally the family and getting individuals to invest in the family, libidinally invested in the family, is that is that what they are against? They want desire. Was that traps? That's the trap of desire is to be caught up within this little sort of, I guess, maybe a circuit between mommy, daddy, me versus opening up desire to the social where it can like flow more in a sort of more deterritorialized fashion. A couple of things there. First of all, they are not their way of talking about whether social oppression or psychic oppression is primary. They change the question, right? Because in a certain sense, from a certain point of view, they are coterminous, right? They're contemporary. This is because there has to be this priming psychically in order for social repression to take hold. But then on the other hand, without social repression, how could something like a super ego already be primed? So there is this kind of it's the same thing they're doing here with the chicken and the egg with who comes first, the child or the father and sort of this infinite regress. The other question you asked, though, was about the trap that desire falls into. And this is in chapter three, when they look at the primitive territorial machine, and they're kind of describing how the trap is. And Freud sometimes does this, sometimes he's better and doesn't fall into this. But in his worst, he does where it's the law prohibits incest as we can kind of see not not in every culture but we we see this recurring anthropological evidence of incest being repressed and being prohibited now they go through a lot of work to try to show a more interesting way in which that comes about but if we just stick with kind of freud incest is prohibited desiring the mother is prohibited therefore it's desired the way of saying it is the prohibition against incest, the prohibition 
is used as evidence for what was desired. It's that extrapolation that grounds a kind of trap, a lore for desire. And I think that this is why they make it a primary thing. Like, you know, the, the law, the prohibition has every, <laughs> it wants to disfigure desire. I was going to say that this just reminded me of how Lacan sort of structures desire as it's the obstacle to the obstacle is what sort of generates the desires kind of what I'm maybe I'm just misunderstanding what you're getting at. But you know what I'm saying? It's like we wouldn't desire it if it wasn't prohibited. You know what I mean? That sort of falls in, within that Lacanian and framework of, a, of negativity relative to desire and lack and all of that, that they're kind of against. So I guess I find that a bit confusing. I'm not exactly sure if Lacan makes it that simple because it does seem like the object cause of desire is a little bit different than just than just a prohibition. But well, yeah, prohibition, any kind of any sort of obstacle would sort of that is what ramps up desiring production. I think it for Lacan is like right because his whole reading is like if if you didn't lack, you wouldn't you would be dead. You wouldn't need anything, right? So that's only because you lack the access to the mother's affection that you desire it. You know what I mean? It structures desire in that way, right? I mean, that's my understanding of Lacan relative to desire. Now, when you're getting the drive, that's a whole other animal because he kind of like, I think he kind of abandons this and goes to drive later on, but it's going to neither here nor there. Yeah. I mean, I think that Lacan has several theories of desire. One has a dialectic of need, demand, which becomes infinite. And then desire gets kind of caught in the circuit of it whereby desire desires to keep on desiring, et cetera. Right. But desire, of, desire is the desire of the other. But you know, the, the prohibition against incest isn't necessarily like an obstacle. It is in a certain sense for them to conclude from the prohibition what is what desire is being prohibited is actually, I think, for them a misnomer because for them what is what is desired is the intense germinal influx right which is the regime of desiring machines if you will it's that it's that if you will it's like passing beyond the wall the limit which you can bounce off of and get back into perverse paranoiac or neurosis you can get back into perversion neurosis that, that's the typical thing that's that's part of the reterritorialization that they're saying comes along with deterritorializations but this is also why they call for a more and more artificial earth such that all at once deterritorialization creates a new world, a new land. Yeah, no, that part was fucking fascinating. But yes, they kind of say straight out that to conclude what the prohibition tells us about desire is already to start from a disfigurement and a displacement of desire. This is the trap that I think you were referring to. And it's in that trap that Oedipus is born from, right? It's kind of interesting because Freud does, they even quote him where he does seem to kind of have this moment where he's like, ah, it wouldn't be prohibited. The mother, you know, incest wouldn't be prohibited if it wasn't desired. And for them, the losing watch you say, no, 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 that's, that's the wrong way to look at it. That's looking at it from the perspective of law, from the perspective of the repressing instance. You're looking at it from the lens of of desire disfigured, and that's disfigured why. as far as castration is concerned, or mm. is that a disfigurement? No, in, I don't think so. Way? No, I guess if, that's to being if familiar. from if from the perspective of castration is in Lacan in Lacanese, like it is, <laughs> it is the law with a capital L, right? And we enter into castration, therefore we get desire. Like they they kind of say that. They bring up Leotard, right, in this account, and they're talking about Marx and Leotard's reading of Marx, and they're saying, like, he's got to find analysis, but he concludes kind of similar things where, what does Jean-Francois Leotard mean in his commentary so profound, nevertheless, on Marx's text when he sees the opening of the non-human as having to be, quote, the entry of the subject into desire through castration, unquote. And they say, long live castration so that desire may be strong. Only fantasies are truly desired. What a perverse human, all too human idea. An idea originating in bad conscious and not in the unconscious. I love that little Nietzsche reference too. It's very nice. For them, you know, entering into the realm of desire through castration is already to see, is already to see things from this perspective of black, from the perspective of of the phallus of the two non-superposable lacks, the lack in woman, which is supposedly with Freud, the lack of the penis, but also man's lack in 
her lack, blah, blah, blah. Like this stuff they, they go through and they, they kind of say it's, it's rubbish. Right. And this is the, they say that Freud and psychoanalysis does this all the time with these two non-superposable lacks whereby, you know, there can be perhaps in the lack a harmony or a unity. It's very much Aristophanes myth of, of the primordial human that's got, it's got four arms and four legs and two heads and it's split by Zeus because it's too, it's too, they're too powerful. They have too much happiness, too much harmony and they're split and you have to go and find your, the person that completes you. All this shit they see is just more myth, more of this tragic myth of the human via this ideology of lack. They discard all of that. And I think that they also discard the notion that, you know, you enter into the realm of desire through castration, which if it's not the law or if it's not into the big other, it's into the realm of representation and language. There is this at least part of Lacan that's like castration is entering into the symbolic, is entering into the domain of language, this structural, this sort of structural mega system in which desire runs through the signifier, blah, blah, blah. And for them, desiring machines. They have these, they may have these chains that can form signifiers, but in and of themselves on their level, on that molecular level, they don't mean anything, right? Those chains are composed of non-signifying, asignifying elements. So I think this is why we have that footnote from Guattari's interview, which kind of gets at this in a materialist sense and kind of takes us out of all this shit about... um, Signification, because as you know, as we as we discussed over and over again, Guattari sees the realm of signification as akin to this molar level, whereby we we think that sort of whereby language is imperial or linguistics is imperialist and tries to reduce everything to signifying language, and they try to show that there's a whole current of polyvocity, there's a whole machinic element that gets repressed from this all too human point of view. Desiring production of machines, psychic apparatuses and machines of desire, desiring machines and the assembling of an analytic machine suited to decode them. The domain of free syntheses where everything is partial, possible, partial connections, included disjunctions, nomadic conjunctions, polyvocal flows and chains, transductive breaks. And for the definition of transduction, which Simon Don uses, but I think Guattari is using in his own way. It's this interview where Guattari says, signs work as much as matter. Matter expresses as much as signs. Transduction is the idea that in essence, something is conducted. Something happens between chains of semiotic expression and material chains. And that's very different from the realm of signification in which signifiers are negatively predisposed in this kind of metastable system of relations whereby they sort of gain meaning. I think that that level is, first of all, already this level of, of lack and negativity, but mm-hmm. second of all, is already on this molar level. Can I read this passage? This is one thing that made me kind of, this one very briefly states, is what perhaps led to my basic question about, is the family just literally this way that desire is, there's sort of a barrier erected between the family and the social. It is not through a desexualizing extension that the libido invests in the lar- invests the large aggregates. On the contrary, it is through a restriction, a blockage, and a reduction that the libido is made to repress its flows in order to contain them in the narrow cells of this type of couple, family, person, objects. Which this is where I thought your example of like the sponge. I like the the sort of coral as maybe even a better example that I can think of, where it's like. This distinction, this barrier between individual and group is far more deterritorialized than like within the human society or or whatever, or at least how it's perceived. If you're losing that model of the colony of polyps that construe a coral reef, which also uses inorganic materials, right, in itself, that's that would be the ideal sort of social would be desires a lot more free and open it's not blocked off by these like familial or other idealist sort of structures that we become libidinally invested in and then that's where things go awry i suppose did any of that make sense you're right there, there's an interesting sort of analogy with these collectivities that we're describing right, right? yeah whether it be coral whether it be uh 
sponges. And the notion, what they kind of diagnose, and of course, this could be a whole episode just on these few pages. What they diagnose is that. Oh, you, you know, know, what's even better is the virus. The virus is a really incredible example of like a desiring machine or like maybe this sort of uh, body without organs, right? Because <laughs> the virus cannot reproduce on its own, right? It has to, it needs a host yes. to propel yes. its cycle of reproduction. Yeah. Much like vi- capital, right? The virus itself is not an organism, but it interacts with organic is it alive is it dead is it it's sort of indeterminate in terms it's, of it's it's both and neither if you yeah, want to exactly. put it that way right? right right is that their point being freud kind of has it that you know you have libido you have sexual libido and in order to invest in society in order to become a well-adjusted individual if you will you've got to order your organs you've got to you got to order your uh you got to know where to shit you've got to yeah, become exactly. potty trained you've right, got to right. you got to regulate your flows you've got to desexualize your libido that's how yeah. that's that's not just how society composes but that's also part of the discontent i think for him right is part partly because we sort of are forced into this social contract whereby we become these neurotic individuals and sort of deep down we want to invest the social libidinally and sexually without restricting and yeah my reading was that the family is that restriction it's a segregate well, yes, because yes. they describe the the two types of social yes. investment being segregative so the family is an s- example of that sort of segregative investment right. that i was that's what i was kind of trying to this is why they're saying that the libido is not desexualized through it's it's only blocked up in the social form of reproduction that is the statistically family. right and this is part of their reading of psychoanalysis and capitalism right where you know on the one hand marx from the vantage point of capitalism we can reread all of history through the notion of sort of abstract labor time of this sort of general essence of labor mm-hmm. and on the other hand with capitalism psychoanalysis shows too that there is this general universal equivalent of desire. There's abstract desire from the standpoint of capitalism. And both are sort of dealing with um, how private property is the element, the subjective element that correlates, right? if you will, yeah. those two subjective essences. Right. Of, yeah. Because the, the, Oh, go ahead. Oh, just this is why they say that labor and desire are equivalent. This becomes kind of their their way of working it out. Right. They say uh, the identity of desire and labor is not a myth. It is rather the active utopia par excellence that designates the capitalist limit to be overcome through desiring production. So I think this is this equation that we find all the time when we talk about Deleuze and Guattari, the element in which we're breathing in the 70s in France is this yoking of Marx and Freud. Right. So this this equivalence of of desire and labor, right, as these abstract essences that capitalism reveals retroactively, if you will, for all of societies, right, as this kind of critical moment. That's interesting. I think that that's the reason why they call it an active utopia is partly linked to their description of some of the positive tasks of schizoanalysis that we'll get to later. But in this section that we read for today. They're talking about the destructive. Right. You can call it negative, but I still think the clearing away itself is a positive because what they're clearing away is not just like the ideology yeah. of lack itself, but they're, they're what they call it, a curatage of the unconscious. They're scouring, they want to scour the unconscious of its, what, of its Oedipal representative forms. I mean, I was thinking of private property as the problem that creates the solution of the family and Oedipus. It, right, because it's it, a way to deal with private property. Well, the family only makes sense, at least in the modern way of the family, like relative. And I've said this many times about surnames. It only makes sense to even have a distinction of a last name if their private property exists and there's some type of continuity of a property that's tied to a last name, right? And that's yeah. blocking up. That's a law. That's a blockage versus the more open a more unrestricted social 
space would not be, have this restriction of private property, right? Like the socius would be more open to creativity and novelty and yeah, they, forms they, that I think they would be more sympathetic to. In their language, what you just described is the form of private property constitutes the center of the factitious re-territorializations of capitalism. Right. So yeah. the factitious re-territorializations of capitalism is the family as the unit of re-territorialization, as the as the form of social reproduction that's dominant. Yeah. Um, and as you said, you know, it, it, it allows for generational wealth, blah, blah, blah. Which helps, I mean, also like the blocking up of I don't know, there's something to it. It sort of is this obstacle to the revolutionary machine because everybody's so invested in their little inheritance, their little cut of the winnings or whatever. You know what I mean? It's it's this enforced lack of capital by marking, by inscription, and whatever that be, like a name is an inscription, right? The markings, et cetera, right? These territorializations of the body of the earth is what causes, that creates the problematic for the socius. The socius has to adapt to the dominant functions of the flows of capital and Ooh. that's why the family exists as it does not because the family is some like essentialist a priori like idealist Ooh. thing that exists i mean i think even it's weird that capital has i mean i guess capital has sort of deterritorialized the family to some extent or like it's working towards right. that but it seems like there's even capital could find novel ways to deal with this problem of maintenance of private property yeah, I mean, and some of what we discussed with Eugene Holland, for example, looked at some alternative forms of collaboration, of community, of coexistence. And in fact, the end of this chapter starts to lay out the problems that follow from posing problems that come from, from posing the family as this blockage. I guess one thing I'll just say in direct response, though, to what you just said about the family is. This is I was thinking about this the other day, how Freud denaturalizes sexuality, but on the other hand, he naturalizes the family. And I think that one of the things the anti Oedipus is trying to do, specifically through the historical, retroactive, critical, sort of singular history that Marx allows us to see from the vantage point of capitalism is haunting all the forms of the socius, is that one of the things they try to do, and I think this is what Oedipus stands for, is denaturalizing the family. Denaturalizing it as a given or as the appropriate form of social reproduction that, that capitalism has spawned, that it would be, whether it be eternal or, uh, or necessary, right? That it's a contingent Yeah, yeah. Uh, Historically form. contingent form, right. Just as Oedipus is a contingent form and not this universal hanging over the yeah, destiny yeah. of all humans. Yeah, I, I track that totally makes sense for me. And so this is why they call for at the end of the chapter, a true politics of psychiatry or anti-psychiatry would consist in the following praxis. One, undoing all the re-territorializations that transform madness into illness. Now, this has to be understood in their next point, which is Two, liberating the schizoid movement of deterritorialization and all the flows in such a way that this characteristic can no longer qualify a particular residue as a flow of madness, but affects just as well the flows of labor and desire of production, knowledge, and creation in their most profound tendency. Yeah. Here, madness would no longer exist as madness, not because it would be, have been transformed into quote-unquote mental illness, but on the contrary, because it would receive the support of all the other flows, including science and art. Once it is said that madness is called madness and appears as such only because it is deprived of this support and finds itself reduced to testifying all alone, yeah, all alone for deterritorialization as a universal process. So this, I think, is kind of interesting because they themselves are calling into question, or they themselves are actually, this is another moment, I think, where this language of, of schizophrenia as a process or the paranoiac fascist pole and the schizophrenic pole, the schizo desire, the different territorial territorialities, you know, of the despot as paranoia, of the primitive territorial machine as perversion, of the, the sort of modern capitalist machine as uh, as neurosis. I think all of this kind of leads up to this point where they're saying, look, reducing madness to mental illness is only feasible because of our sort of our sort of uh 
technical what? advancement? Our dominant images of thought, our sort of, you know, technocratic ideas of rationality, ideas of, you know, a lot of which are inherited from this capitalist matrix in which a productive member of society is a sane member of society. You know, um, I was thinking about this the other day when I was thinking about 12 Monkeys, you know, when Brad Pitt's character is kind of talking about how, you know, Bruce Willis ends up in the, uh, yes. the asylum with him. Right. He like wants to make a phone call because he thinks he's been arrested or whatever. And, and Brad Pitt's like, you know, the, they don't want us to contact the outside world. We might like infect them yeah, right, right, with, right. with our madness. And then he starts going on this rant. Obviously, he has many of them, but he starts going on this rant about what makes you a, a good individual, a sane individual in, in modern society is, is being a good consumer, right? And so I was kind of thinking about how the way that sort of Marx, Marx kind of says that the capitalist and the miser are basically the same person except there's something even more perverse in the capitalist right there's something you know they're the the Liz and Guadra say that the capitalist is the first to be fucked by the system because it's it's impelling them forward to ever produce this surplus so you know you know investing one's savings in a bank is a rational way of doing things you know hiding your your money under your your mattress is "Quote unquote crazy conventionally, right? So you can you can do all these these blocking up the flows of money to the right, etc. Yeah, which is interesting, a, right? Given this anti Oedipus. So I think that what they're kind of saying is like when we look at what they're talking about as schizophrenia as a process, they kind of are saying if you stop the process or you know presuppose a goal, you get this clinical entity. But taking the flows of madness all the way to the power of what they can do if they are supported by science and art. I mean, because obviously a lot of the shit in science and art are mathematics, philosophy, whatever. And their extremist examples, some of that shit is fucking wild and crazy and counterintuitive. And against Pythagoras, (laughs) right? Cult of Pythagoras, etc. Right. Did they commit human sacrifices, incidentally? Not that I know of. It's possible. We don't know a lot about it. They definitely did a lot of drugs, though. And that, that again, is kind of, you know, there's a sense in which the sober mind is the the flows of sanity and, and the flows of sobriety, notwithstanding some of their, their cautions in, in, in A Thousand Plateaus, but there is a sense in which this notion that, a, that flows of madness are counterproductive to, as they said, capitalism is in itself kind of schizophrenic because it's constantly... It's constantly approaching the wall, but then pushing those those walls back, right? To to create these new markets of value, these new ways of of accumulating super surplus value, and that's how also they're they're not at all this process of schizophrenia because schizophrenia is the process of schizophrenia as they describe it isn't about accumulating surplus value, which seems mad in this modern way of living, and so they're kind of saying if if the movement of deterritorialization in all the flows, desire, labor production, knowledge, creation, if they, in fact, sort of unleashed, then the flows of madness, schizophrenia as a process, wouldn't be responsible for testifying all alone for deterritorialization as a universal process. If it were subtended by philosophy, science, art, instead of having to be cordoned off, right, into an institution, into an asylum instead of having to to be locked up and locked away to protect the sane ones at a certain limit or are taken to a certain degree of power we would be swept along with madness to a certain extent in a positive way this is why they they quote foucault everything oh, yeah, that, that foucault quote is aces it's amazing love it yeah every, everything we we experience today in the mode of a limit or of strangeness, or of the unbearable, will have joined again with the serenity of the positive. I think that that's their point about schizophrenia as a process that pierces through this wall that that's the absolute limit of capitalism, right? That piercing through this wall, pushing the, you know, a breakthrough and not a breakdown is kind of what they're going for. And this is why I think in this book, even if they they do say that there are these re-territorializations that come with deterritorializations. They still think that accelerating the process, which is one of the ways they describe it, taking it to the nth degree 
would mean that madness and mental illness, madness would no longer be considered as mental illness. It would take on its own positive form. We do see this in forms of genius, right? In forms of extreme creativity, we can see flows of madness at work. I think this is why Artaud is a, it's constantly being called upon to shore up their argument. I think whether it's apocryphal or not, or just an anecdote, the, you know, Benjamin Franklin with his little kite and key to conduct electricity, there's something mad in this notion, again, whether it happened or not, but there's still something mad in, in someone who is the height of rationality, right? And, and a founding father. There's all kinds of other examples, obviously, that we could use. But I think that when science is turned into this bureaucracy of the production of capital and surplus value, or for the military industrial complex, or you know, technology becomes a business, as Marx says, when science is kind of subtracted from its power of creation, then yeah, it's going to be on the side of capital. It's going to be the side of rationality. It's going to be against these flows of madness that they're thinking of in a creative, positive sense. Mm -hmm. The same with art, right? Art, subtracting the flows of madness from art, do you really even have art anymore? Or is it just, is it not reduced to a kind of pleasantry? It's the same with like reducing literature to its meaning rather than its effects. And I think this is why they end the chapter again with this, you can call it a metaphor, but I think they mean it uh, very literally where they are looking for or trying to problematize an active point of escape where the revolutionary machine, the artistic machine, the scientific machine, and the schizoanalytic machine become parts and pieces of one another. Right. So I think that in a certain sense, if there's something philosophical in this work, and it's not merely a meditation on psychoanalysis and Freud, it's not merely kind of just a political intervention into an ethics of fascism or against fascism, right? It's not merely just an artistic collaboration and collation of different authors, novelists, painters, and if it's not just a kind of wild, mad science that groups together geneticists and physicists and chemists, if there's a philosophical core to it, it is trying to get these different machines, right? The art machine, the science machine, the analytic machine, the revolutionary political machine. It's trying to get them assembled and working towards, you know, this, this goal of of what? Well, of, as we said, destroying these, uh, these, these re-territorializations of madness back into the clinic or into the asylum, really, at worst, and being able to conjoin these flows that would support its mobilization, the mobilization of the flows of madness supported by these other forms, these other creative forms. And I think that that's precisely what Watery is thinking of when he's thinking about institutions that don't just try to recreate these patriarchal or familial settings, or at worst, again, these 19th century barbaric dungeons and asylums where you just lock up the mad away. You keep them from infecting the rest of society. There is a certain sense in which that, that metaphor is taken but turned positive. Like, what if what if madness could infect the rest of society? Would that not perhaps be this, this active utopia where labor and desire are seen as, as this identity, right? This active utopia, I think, is partly what the collaboration of these different machines is what they're going for. I was going to go back to um, incest a bit because of, uh, like, incest, again, it only kind of makes sense post hoc after you have a family you know what i mean because my mother my sister etc right if the social is more open and there is no mommy daddy me then the concept of incest can't really operate on the same way yeah you yeah know what i mean it's only this regime of private property where incest would even need to be repressed necessitate repression now that in the economic, I mean, this is where this shit could all go back to the the primary economy being 
the most primitive economy is the trading of women. That is the through line that ex- the backbone of human history right. is the the way that the patriarchal forces have sort of marshaled the reproductive capacity of women. It's almost a sort of communism, and I forget maybe it was Nick Land who even went to that in that direction of like the way that even to this day it's like the reproductive capacity of women aren't owned per se at least not directly right they're not held in quite the same way as private property the means of production right the communism it would be among the men the men yes um, yes. among among the tribes and the locality and they're they're negotiating amongst themselves for marriages the trading, I think, is maybe not the right word, but I do think that the negotiating for this is why they call the primitive territorial machine perverse, because it is for them this manner in which the men organize together, as you said, patriarchically to, to arrange marriages. This is when they say that they're the most homosexual, ironically enough, because in a certain way, they are the women are the objects and the means by which the men perpetrate their lineages so they're negotiating amongst themselves directly this object of sexuality of Mm -hmm. generation reproduction well even to this day women's reproductive capacity is in a sense held in common it's still like women are not women are not chained up in like uh breeding asylums or something like that which could you know it's certainly possible right there is a possible world where what's the fucking handmaid's tale yeah the handmaid like exactly see so that's, that's a great I, that's a great example of, think, of what I'm I, getting at if you if that makes sense. I mean the fact that 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 women's sexuality and reproduction is still so highly regulated and as we've seen with the the basic inclination to overturn Roe v. Wade and return it to the states and we know how states rights is a catch-all for some of the worst propagations of legal matters. We know that that's kind of how they tried to handle slavery, right, to leave it to the states. And we saw how that turned out. So the fact that Handmaid's Tale is actually still making new episodes and has a new season, there's something kind of, I'm sure people still love the show and that's that's fine and stuff, but I know that it's, to me, a little bit egregious and a little bit, um, yeah, I'll just say egregious because it's a little too on the nose, yeah. right? I mean, it was already precarious before this proposed decision that, the Supreme Court might take up to overrule it, to overrule Roe v. Wade. But now with the, with that being a very likely reality, yeah, it's it's bad. But but but, but as we've seen even before this, states across the nation, and we, we're in the South, so we know this, Georgia, Texas, Kansas, Oklahoma, all the, and I can name, I could go on and name a bunch more. There have been more and more laws proposed to restrict and regulate all kinds of manners of women's rights to regulate or as they see fit their their own reproductive cycle. So being reduced kind of not just to numbers as we like to think in capitalism, but to but to uteruses to uh Yeah. So the state sort of in a sense owns the reproductive capacity of women. So that's why they're well, that's not exactly but own maybe isn't the right word, but definitely definitely has power over those systems of reproduction. Yeah. And, I mean, I guess it, they don't own, yeah, that's a fraught word, I suppose. Yeah. But, but they have dominion over, I suppose. But yeah, I mean, a lot of the language that you see is about protecting the, the life of the unborn, of the defenseless and all this, all this talk about, you know, all this talk though, in a certain sense, it gets clothed in this kind of, fundamentalist christian notion of of all life is sacred and all this stuff but in a certain sense too we see that it that that it easily flows into this dialogue about reproducing families not just reproducing children but 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 uh you know reproducing the the family form and also it goes without saying i'm sure reproducing the means of abstract labor right so this is stuff that we've talked about on, on the show before, I know. So a lot of it does maybe seem redundant, but but obviously this is part of what they're, you know, if, if Anti-Oedipus is a book of 
sexual liberation. I think that that's skipping a few steps. <laughs> yeah. Because in a certain sense, attacking familialism, as they call it, and psychoanalysis mm-hmm. and capitalism, in that sense, that leads to all sorts of other consequences. And this is why they aren't necessarily talking just about sexual liberation in any direct sense. Right. You know, and Foucault himself had reason to be kind of wary in his history of sexuality about the about just this this leap to sexual liberation. In a certain sense, I think that for Foucault and for Deleuze and Guattari, even if they they deal with these topics in different ways, I think they would say that this is solving a problem that is actually two or three series down. Like there are I think they they're they're trying to go back to a more fundamental problem. Obviously Foucault has different has different aims, but I think that they they have shared goals in a certain sense, right? I, they, yeah. he, he's got di- he's got different targets of critique. That's what I mean. Yeah, but, but I think that they have some shared goals, and so like when they're targeting psychoanalysis, it's not that psychoanalysis, as they say, invented Oedipus. In a certain sense, maybe Freud gave it they gave it that name mm-hmm. and gave it that mythical garb and that the- theatrical representative symbolic sort of. Crystallization, yeah. But in a certain sense, Oedipus was already sort of there. It just took it took capitalism, it took the birth of psychoanalysis with the conditions of capitalism to then see Oedipus as this form that in a certain sense is propped up by beliefs, but in the other in another sense, it has objective conditions of possibility that they try to tra- track in chapter three. Mm-hmm. So psychoanalysis, you know reinforces this movement of whether it be the familial determination of the, of the social form of reproduction or the form of social reproduction, or whether it invents this one last priest to prop up this belief and disbelief. They phrase it in a in hundred different ways in this book. I do think that this is why in a certain sense, when they talk about sexuality in this chapter, it seems distant from what you might think in a post sixties discourse, you might think it would be about free love or about the liberation of desires. In a certain sense, their notion of liberation of desire or desiring machines isn't necessarily any simple, straightforward sense in which one would think about it's okay. Don't, don't be repressed sexually, like go out and have fun, blah, blah, blah. I think that they, that's not really what's going on here. I feel like it's almost like altering the material substrate of the social to reproduce something new and well, that's I like that. privileging a bit, but yeah, they want to modify the substrate of the socius and open up the flow, opening up the flows of desire is not synonymous with, with sexual liberation per se. That could be an aspect of it but it's not the whole picture i suppose yeah because in a a certain sense it's like what is sexual liberation for Deleuze and Guattari i think they would say at least in the the sections we read today it's not necessarily about you know don't worry about what mommy daddy want you can fuck whoever you want or you know you it really seems to be what is sexual liberation from and we mentioned some of the things that can be from it can That's be from yeah. it can be from the state's regulations of our reproductive systems, women's reproductive system, systems, and specifically because men's have still been pretty, in a certain sense, pretty free to to roam and disseminate. Right. But also, I think more fundamentally, sexual liberation from the Oedipal familial reproductive model, and so that entails a whole web of more complex questions than that do involve capitalism that do involve psychoanalysis as a reinforcer and that do involve getting rid of these, these different ways of thinking and feeling about whether it be mommy, daddy, whether it be, you know, the, the form of society in which we live, obviously, one of the things that's in the background, but that I think is co that, that reinforces familialism is also forms of nationalism is also forms of, of chauvinism of all types where we, we are tied, you know, we are 
tied to a state, to a nation, to a locality and want to be a part of that and belong in a sense because of what we're thrown into different families. And so we're kind of born with wanting to, as for me, like root for the Braves or or (laughs) root for America, root for our town and these different like uh, segregative yeah the bindle investments exactly so these different forms of you can call it cheerleading some of it's passive some of it's active can easily feed into types of fascist fascizing paranoiac investments right where we we instinctively want to want to root for our home team yeah we instinctively want to root f- so we both passively and actively invest into our form of collectivities, you know, in varying scales of magnitude that can lead to those kind of investments can easily lead to overt investments into our our sort of identity groups, you know, into all sorts of racisms and supremacisms and and whatnot. And and I think that even though that that part of their critique isn't as salient in these three sections it's all throughout the book right they bring it up just a little bit in the first section i think on uh on the social field but they're not going to necessarily beat a dead horse too often so we have to remember that this critique of familialism is also critiquing these other forms of belonging that are sort of means of rooting for and investing in these superior forms of these dominant forms. And I think this is why for them, the unconscious, you know, it's delirious, it's racial and racializing and racist. It's, it's not just the cop in us and the fascist in us that we have to be aware of. We have to be wary of the psychoanalyst in us. And I know that I can easily fall into this trap of, you know, of, sort of analyzing intentions and desires, not just within myself, but within within others, within my loved ones. You know, and there's a way in which one can perhaps do this in order to be empathetic and, and sort of to be sensitive to the sort of emotional dynamisms around us. But there's also ways in which we can do this in order to take advantage, in order to also to to, to feel protected, but also to feel like we're mastering this flux around us. And so there, there are ways in which we can use it to, to dominate without really becoming aware of it. Yeah. It's seductive. I wanted to maybe talk a little bit about maybe get to some of the basics of like the capitalist axiomatic, like what the fuck even is an axiomatic to begin with. (laughs) I know we have talked about this a little bit and, you know, I see you've written some stuff down here. The easiest way I try to think about it without going into some of the technical stuff, which we've done before, but if the first forms of Socius, right, the primitive territorial machine is is based on codes, and we've seen how some of this works where you have different forms of valuation based on even prestige is a form of code and can accrue to one with like the giving of feasts and with expenditure, right? But we've also seen that these different forms of valuation can occur in gift giving and where, you know, quote unquote money is very circumscribed and constricted to sort of a very small amount of of what we might call goods, of tradable goods. So there's these markets, if you will, these interactive, not just in terms of exchange, bartering, potlatch, all the stuff that we've talked about Mm -hmm. ad nauseum. But then again, even um, as you mentioned earlier, the exchange of women would have its own sort of system of values and, and recompenses. And how when money is introduced into one of these coded economies, if you will, coded libidinally, coded monetarily, coded Mm -hmm in terms of valuation and prestige, et cetera, it scrambles all the codes. It scrambles all the codes. And now there's an overcoding instance of money that can participate in each of these different economies equivalently. Mm-hmm. And it renders the codes equivalent. So this is part of the decoding that capitalism brings. But 
you know, in the intermediary, you have the despotic regime, the Erstadt, the state, and its forms of currency, which aren't yet capital money, as they want to say in the modern form, mm -hmm. but that cause an overcoding, whereby the, the sort of territorial codes sometimes are kind of preserved and kind of exist alongside as archaisms, but sometimes take on a new code that's directly sort of overcoded and stamped with a new valuation from on, on high. It's with money capital that we have this decoding of all codes where we have the abstract general equivalent of money as this as this quantitative flux that again even if certain archaisms are allowed to subsist or that subsist or even if the axiomatic of capital which is what we're trying to talk about here can create these archaisms these archaic territorialities and these and fall back into certain general relative codes there is the sense in which capitalism as, as the, the regime of capital money, as the abstract equivalent, no longer has codes or overcodings. And I think that this is why they call it the axiomatic, because there's something simply about the fact that these codes are not in relation to the flows of the territory or to the overcoding of a state despotic instance that's kind of an imminent unity from on high, there is a sense in which all the codes are scrambled relatively, if not absolutely, in certain instances. And so what do we have in place of that, rather than codes or overcodes, we have an axiom. And in the most basic sense, we can think about this in terms of science, in terms of, um, in terms of mathematics. What is an axiom but that which is taken as a given for a system to work? So for the system to work, and there has to be a general equivalent of money. Or, or is that what you're well, going towards or no? Well, well, the, the general equivalent of money makes axiomatics possible, if you will, oh, okay. right? The gotcha. general okay. equivalent <laughs> of, of money that, that scrambles all the codes makes an axiomatic possible. And so what, what they say is like, okay, so this is an example I always used. It's not a great example, but this is just like you can imagine in uh, during the Cold War with the Red Scare and the blacklisting, owning um, the complete works of Marx and Engels might be something that would be blacklisted. We can think of all kinds of different black markets with marijuana, for example. There could be easily be an axiomatic added to the American capitalist system that would federally allow for marijuana to be purchasable. I know that Marlboro, for example, already has like five or six patents for Marlboro Greens or whatever the fuck you <laughs> want to call it to sell joints in, in a pack. So, you know, all it takes is adding that one axiom, say that the collected works of Marx and Engels can be bought on Amazon. Uh, you know, you can buy at your dispensary. Any of your little desires, your personal whims and and wants can be catered to by the capitalist system because in the in the end, it doesn't really care about codes. It doesn't care about a list of norms or or values. Right. Yeah. If it can create surplus value, then it'll sell it. It'll sell a, a Che Guevara a t shirt. It'll sell. It can repackage anything that seems counter productive or counter to the capitalist institution, it can repackage it and sell it for a profit. I mean, this is where Nick Land says that capital is escape. Any attempt to escape capital is doing capital because it can always sort of it can always push those those limits back and, and precisely and precisely. circumscribe into a market. The dynamism of the market, like you'd have to counter that with like a steady state. No surplus at all is being generated. Maybe this is why, like, I don't know. I mean, this would get into arguments regarding state capitalism, et cetera. And like, but I guess Guattarian is sort of like, ah, I don't know. I'll cut this out. <laughs> no, you don't have to, because I mean, you know, we can talk about how China isn't pure communism. If it ever was, obviously the Soviet Union has fallen. So it's, it's got its archaisms. It's got its. But America isn't just, we talk, I mean, you can talk about free markets all you want, but there's obviously a state apparatus that's regulating flows and, and, and designating what is black labor, black markets, what's regulating what is uh, sort of above board and taxable and allowable. And in the end, in a certain sense, capitalism, we can think about capitalism for each nation state or whatever the fuck, but it doesn't care about nations and in a certain sense nations are are an archaism that prevent capital from, from flowing yeah from flowing like it doesn't care about i mean taxes are means by which the state apparatus perpetuates itself 
right? And so in a certain sense, capital doesn't care about, that actually doesn't want taxes, right? We, we've seen that in some of the most virulent capitalists that right. we've seen that with uh, the, the ideas that Democrats and, and Republicans have is raise taxes on the wealthy, tax bigger businesses, or cut taxes, right? To bring business to your area and stimulate your economy and blah, blah, blah. These two counteracting tendencies are kind of just two sides of the same coin. In a certain sense, you know, on the one hand, it makes sense to tax the rich. But on the other hand, if you're going to funnel the majority of that money into an ever increasing budget for a military industrial complex, that's not very much more productive than than cutting taxes and cutting in a certain sense, you can think of all the, the different social safety nets that are, that are cut. And so it does harm some of the, the most disadvantaged. But on the other hand, if you're just outsourcing that destitution onto other countries, this is part of the perversion when talking about this stuff. But, but in any case, I hope I kind of answered this thing about axiomatic that it is merely kind of positing a, a given for for the the sort of capitalist system that you just add a new axiom at, you just add a, add a new axiom for whether it be new commodities on the market, new ways in which money can accrue. We think about the different axiomatics involved with the evolution of money capital in Bitcoin and um, NFTs, these other things. Those are just sort of following a, a kind of logic that don't necessarily break the capitalist form, but may attempt to go around its solidification in some of the less volatile, less velocity-based, archaic forms that it has, whether it be in paper money or even in centralized banks, blah, blah, blah. You can just imagine all these different axioms that are involved with the flows of commodities, the flows of of money, the flows of the flows of consumer interactions, right? Because what are all the different axioms that had to be formulated for the internet and how in certain sense the legislative bodies appended to each nation state is always lagging behind that accelerated movement yeah. that capital is proposing for its expansiveness. It's ever expanding its its limits. What Nick Land would refer to uh, the counter veiling tendency would be the sort of like the human security system is trying to ward off these these deterritorializations <coughs> to prevent the earth from becoming to pre- sort of prevent a new earth from arising in a sense to prevent yeah. the in to prevent the inhuman from sort of taking over maybe that's it they even bring up here a little bit about non what is it the non-anthropomorphic representation of sex the non-human sex right yeah I thought which I had is, grabbed something about that. Which yeah, is non. A, was there anything else that you wanted to sort of highlight? We hit some of the big points. I, I am glad we we talked about the end of this section three, where they talk about this politics of the true politics of anti psychiatry. I am glad we talked a little bit about some of the other building blocks that we've discussed in earlier chapters. I think that. What'll be interesting is moving from this destructive aspect, right? Destroying the rock of castration in Oedipus, right? Destroying, um, destroying the means by which the sort of unconscious is triangulated and disassembled and sort of scattered into individual global persons and, and sort of unearthing this molecular, machinic, quantum, unconscious, being able to sort of, you know, this understanding of schizophrenia as a, as a process that would not be isolated from science, art, philosophy, potentially, if it can, if it can catch up. I think that, that kind of stuff will help us prepare for the last two sections of the book in the positive, positive task. And they say the negative or destructive task of schizoanalysis is in no way separable from its positive tasks. All these tasks are necessarily undertaken at the same time. So, you know, the fact that we we were able to talk about the uh, the destructive side of schizoanalysis, kind of 
the curatage of the unconscious, discovering, rediscovering the unconscious as orphan, atheist, anarchist, right? And they say it's, it's not an orphan because it's lost its mommy and daddy. It's an orphan because the unconscious has never been yoked to mommy and daddy in its essence. Once we move to the molecular unconscious underneath or beyond this sort of individual molar representation of the unconscious as existing in our brains, then we can say that the unconscious is orphan, constitutively orphan, right? So that the the bait that they give us at the beginning of the chapter as like the chicken or the egg first, the father or the child, from the standpoint of the unconscious, those questions are from the standpoint of the molecular unconscious, right? From the anedipal unconscious, those questions lose all meaning. Yeah. So, I mean, along those lines, it is interesting that they say that it's not the child that brings Oedipus, but it's the father. It begins with Laius, right? With Oedipus's dad. He hears the oracle say, your son's going to fucking kill you and take your spot. You could say it begins with the oracle, but if the oracle is, is if you could consider it just an objective, neutral, prophesying declaration of what will happen. Or if you want to think of the oracle as already a manifestation of Lias's desire. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Ooh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Instead, yeah. Of, instead of it being just this external entity, it's actually like this internal sort of. Uh, I like that. It's the same with the with, you know, that's tragedy. You could also look at myth with Kronos, right? Kronos is kind of has this oracle moment, too, where right. he's told. Just as he killed his father to take take the reins, you know, he's told that he'll have a son. He'll have a child that's going to overthrow him and kill him, right? So what does he do? He starts eating his children, right? And it, it takes his wife, Rhea, to trick him, right? When Zeus is born, he swallows the stone and then Zeus is able to fulfill the prophecy or whatever. But it starts with, this is something that they kind of mentioned in passing in chapter two, I think, but this was something that, that I thought of a long time ago before I read Anti-Oedipus. I was like 12. I was thinking about, it should be called the Kronos complex, not the Oedipus complex, right? Because the Oedipus complex makes it seem like the desire is, is inherent in the child to kill the father. Whereas if you look at the myths of Kronos or you look at the Greek myths, it's obvious that, the, that it's the father whose actions in this kind of fatal, tragic way, bring about his destruction. Because what if Kronos had been a good father and never had eaten his children and had shown them love and blah, 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 like perhaps it wouldn't be a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's by being this tyrant who is cannibalizing his young in order to remain the, you know, this position that he himself didn't inherit but took by force. So very yeah. dialectical in the way that, yeah, that sort of the more you squeeze, the more you lose. Yeah. And, and, but their point about this being, this is from a certain point of view viable, right? That it begins with Lias, it begins with Cronus. This makes sense. But on the other hand, you know, you can still do an infinite regress by saying they were children right, once, right. True. blah, blah, blah. And so they, they showed this to be a false dichotomy, a false problem. The chicken and the egg is this paradox is not necessarily worth investing our time in because it's at the molecular level that the unconscious knows no global persons it doesn't know daddy it doesn't know child it doesn't understand in a certain sense it doesn't really understand murder because it doesn't understand death negation you know and i think that that's that's kind of what they're trying to get at when they are talking about designing machines when they're talking about the molecular unconscious, not the unconscious of a of an individual with a unity, with an identity, mm-hmm. right? But I think as Dorothea kept saying a couple of weeks ago, the the larval subjects, right? The or was that Christopher? Maybe Christopher was the one who was talking about larval subjects. I think that was Christopher. In any case, it's good to get back on the sad in the saddle and and try to finish up this book because I know we got other books we want to we want to yeah, go through, right? Yeah, I can't believe we're nearing an end. You want to wrap well, up there? Yeah, I think I think we should uh, we should wrap up there. I think that's a good good idea. I think I'm losing steam anyway, <laughs> to be honest. So. 
we'll wrap up there. And that will be this week's edition of the Machine and Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins. The very rules of eating, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is This is the typical violence of information. It's violent because what happens there is the murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. With nothing left but recycled, whitewashed, lobotomized people, as in a block work orange.